we need to use what the fashion industry is using and the entertainment industry is using. Yeah. They know how to connect to people's hearts and not just their minds. So why not take the same tools to help people make the right, better choices for themselves? I've got to say, researching you and your career over the last few days has been an absolute joy. Uh, I think I've learned a lot about myself as I researched your life. And you're someone who's achieved so much. You know, you're a female business leader, entrepreneur, you're a mother. I saw recently on Instagram, your daughter got married. Um, so congratulations. But I thought, I, I thought a really nice place to start would be You've had such a full life. You've achieved so much business-wise, family-wise. What do you regard as your biggest achievement to date? Well, definitely being a mother and my relationship with my daughters, which is absolutely amazing and um, has been through a lot of ups and downs like any relationship. But now we are in a place of of deep connection and deep friendship, as well as mother-daughter, and seeing them um, grow and build their own lives and want to have an impact in the world, it means so much to me. And, and also, I think the way I've been working on myself, you know, it's kind of amazing to look back and see how much I knew I wanted to do internally, like the way I wanted to live my life um, as a dance, as I came up with early on in my 20s that I wanted my life to be a dance between making it happen and letting it happen. And yet how much longer it took to actually live like that. So going back through all journals, I see how... Early on, I knew how I wanted to live my life, but it took longer to live it that way than, than I thought it would take. And that's definitely um, what I feel is the greatest achievement in any life. You know, how are we changing the way we live our life and our attitude and, and um, how much loving are we bringing into everything we are doing? Yeah. I mean, it's wonderful to hear that. And, and as you were describing that, Ariana, I've been thinking back to you talking about your very first book, which I think was written, is it 50 years ago? Could that be right? Yes. You know, I actually, I just uh, celebrated my 70th birthday in July. Wow. So, um, yes, my first book was written when I was 23. Um, I, it was, it was a coincidence that I became a writer and that's also something interesting to, for all of us to look at in our lives, because I was at Cambridge studying economics and, um, I was going to be going to the Harvard Kennedy school to do a postgrad degree in politics. And, um, and then, um, an English publisher who happened to see a debate I participated in at the Cambridge Union sent me a letter asking me if I, if I wanted to write a book on the views I expressed in the debate. And I wrote back and I said, I can't write. And he wrote back and he said, can you have lunch? And I took the train from Cambridge, went to London, had lunch with him. And he, and he offered me a modest advance to write a book. And, um, and I thought, wow, uh, that's an unexpected <laughs> turn of events. And I, I had too many friends walking around with unpublished manuscripts. So I, um, I, I said yes. And that was how my first book, which was about the changing role of women, uh, came about. Yeah. Yeah, there was an, quite an incredible story, wasn't there, for you to actually get to Cambridge in the first place? I believe that that was something that you you just saw in a magazine when you were a lot younger. Yes, in fact, I'm. We have a special podcast. Would love you to be on it called Meditative Story, 
which is about a pivotal story in our guest lives. And mine was about how I got into Cambridge, how literally I saw a picture of Cambridge um, on the cover of a magazine and I got home and I said to my mother, I want to go there. And my mother, who was an amazing woman, um, didn't say what everybody else said, which was, don't be ridiculous, you can't go there. We have no money. You don't speak English. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and it's hard for English girls to get into Cambridge. My mother said, let's find out how you can get there. And she found out that I could learn English and take my GCEs through the British Council, et cetera, et cetera. We even, she even found two cheap tickets uh, to go to London and go see Cambridge, literally. It was an early visualization exercise <laughs> because we didn't go to see anybody at Cambridge, the admissions office or anything like that. We just went to see Cambridge and uh, visualize myself as a student there. So anyway, I did um, get into Cambridge and that definitely changed my life. Yeah. In what way would you say it changed your life? Because you grew up you didn't grow up in the UK, you moved to the UK. And it is interesting hearing that, that, you know, visualization is something that athletes do, you know, Tiger Woods does that before he plays his final round at a major, um, you know, Usain Bolt will probably do that before he runs 100 meters. Yet you as a, I don't know, 14 year old, 16 year old girl is, is also visualizing this university where you want to study. Exactly, without knowing exactly the impact that had, but it suddenly made it real. And um, and for me, it changed my life because um, a lot of uh, things that happened in my life, like being um, asked to write a book, it was as a function of being at Cambridge and uh, also... Um, taking part in the Cambridge Union, becoming president of the Cambridge Union, learning to speak and debate and and use words to move hearts and minds. That was really the biggest thing I learned at Cambridge, whether it's through writing or through speaking, how can you move hearts and minds? As a parent myself, I hear someone like you say that, and I'm, I'm immediately drawn to my kids and I think, well, I have concerns sometimes over what schools are now prioritizing, what they're teaching our children, given the way that the world is changing. But the fact that you found debating so pivotal and what you said there, how do you use words to influence and change hearts and minds? Do you therefore think that one of the key skills we can teach our children is how to have a good grasp of language and how to use words effectively? Yes, I really believe that. It's also an incredible source of confidence. Um, and when you uh, think of um, how many people are terrified of public speaking, uh, it's supposed to be you know, one of the biggest fears um, that people have. And, and I definitely had that fear. And I was a lousy speaker and I had an even heavier accent at a time when in England, you know, accents were definitely ridiculed. Uh, but then to see how um, I really, I really practiced and practiced <laughs> and uh, developed that new muscle. And it's a little bit about your what you are writing about the five minutes and what Thrive is about, which is micro steps and what our friend BJ Fogg calls tiny habits. Yeah. It's basically all the same. It's like that you change habits and you change your life and you acquire new skills through these micro habits and these micro practices. And that was definitely true when it came to speaking for me. And and the, the amount of confidence that that uh, brought me. Yeah, it's interesting to hear because I, I you know, I, I was super delighted when you enjoyed my book and you, you gave it such great support in America, which, which is, you know, I'm so grateful for. 
I think back to why I'm so passionate about these little habits, these five minute steps. And you could see that in me even as a teenager. We used to come home from school. My mum would have um, lots of kind of Indian food ready in the fridge or on the stove. And we'd put it in the microwave for two minutes to, to heat up. Uh, because then there, there was this soap at the time called Neighbours in the UK, and we used to watch it at 5.35. My mum thought we could multitask, we could eat and watch Neighbours, and that means we've got more time for homework afterwards. But what's relevant is in those two minutes while the food was in the microwave, I'd be doing press-ups or I'd be doing sit-ups. So, <laughs> and it's really interesting to, to see where I am in my career now, that that was sort of inbuilt into me I think I just had it as an innate thing that I liked doing when I was so young. And it sounds like you also, even though your whole business and your your new company, you know, promotes micro habits, it sounds like you also had that within you at a young age. Yes, that's a, I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. And and the fact that we do that unconsciously. Um, but now we have so much science behind it and so much data, and we can actually do it consciously. And at Thrive, we, we teach a lot of habit stacking, which is exactly what you are practicing while your food was in the microwave. Um, you know, habit stacking around gratitude is, is a key part of what we teach. You know, you're washing your hands. Think of what three things you're grateful for. You're washing the dishes. Um, anytime your brain is not actively engaged. Yeah. No, I love it. And I, I want to talk about Thrive because I think when you set up this company, people needed help in the workplace. And I, I sort of think that has been magnified even more this year over the past few months. Um, before we get into that, I think your story is really worth telling, I mean, why you're so passionate about this, why you set up Thrive, because you had to really face it, didn't you, in your own life. And, and I really want to touch on that as well, Arena. So do we need that kind of pain point before we make change? Or actually, as you tell your story, can you also elaborate on, can people also make those changes without hitting that sort of extreme point of ill health? Oh, I definitely hope so. But unfortunately, most of us don't. That's really the truth. You know, there's absolutely no reason on earth why we we can't. Um, but uh, if we look around, we see that uh, millions of people reach a burnout with terrible consequences to their health. Um, and then often begin to make changes and then fall off the wagon of the changes. So that's why I'm so passionate about micro habits, because um, at least they can be incorporated easily into our daily lives and lead to new habits and a new life without that um, constant uh, sense of achievement, falling off the wagon, going back, and that makes people feel a lot of shame and guilt about what they're doing. What do you think you would have said before you had your incident where you hit your head, which I hope you can share with my audience? If someone had told you six months before that, hey, look, you need to slow down, you're working too hard, you need to start applying micro habits, what do you think you would have said to them back then? You know, I think if they had mentioned micro habits, I might have listened more if they, than if they had said, you know, you need, you need to really change your life. You need to yeah. give up X or not do Y. Um, so that's why I think that the concept of micro habits, which was definitely not at all as prevalent in 2007 when I collapsed from burnout, hit my head on my desk and broke my cheekbone, uh, is, I think, a cause of tremendous optimism uh, in helping people change their lives. And I, I know we're seeing amazing results. Uh, at the, the, but the, the other thing that has to shift 
as well as micro steps and micro habits is a, is our mindset because um if you had told me before i collapsed um that hey you know there's another way to do your life and you're actually going to be more productive if you do it another way i would have had to shift my mindset because my mindset was the mindset of our age which is to be successful to achieve a lot you just need to power through yeah you just need to be on all the time you know everything else is supposed to be self indulgent and being a bit of a research nerd you know i've looked at where did we get that idea from and it goes back to the first industrial revolution when we started revering machines and the goal with machines is the same as the goal with software which is to minimize downtime yeah. you know we now for example proudly say when we launch a new piece of software that um it has 99.999% uptime yeah so that's really what we um what we need to change first the mindset and then through micro steps we see how we can build new habits and new muscles no for sure now you mentioned the 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 first industrial revolution there do you think we are currently in the middle of a a new workplace revolution because things have changed now things have changed significantly and how does this change impact what your company is trying to do and help people with their well-being yes things have changed significantly because um we've reached a point where it's much harder to ignore the problems chronic conditions like um diabetes and hypertension and a mental health crisis predate the pandemic but now with the pandemic is a is a huge crisis but also a catalyst uh, for fundamental changes here because it it's like a forced pause and and during this pause um many many people are looking at their lives and saying hey you know maybe there's another way to live maybe we don't have to live in this in this state of frenzy and and we are finding among multiple populations both those who are working from home and frontline workers we have a a big partnership with Walmart for example and are working with their employees in the stores and through our thrive zip up and it's kind of amazing wrong and to see the results we're seeing people like losing over 100 pounds and and reversing diabetes through this um one better choice a day as we call it one better choice and there are small choices uh, around food around movement around gratitude sleep family and the changes they make and the other thing that we are finding um has a huge impact is storytelling yeah so they don't just make these changes in their lives they write about it and then their peers are encouraged uh to participate yeah i mean storytelling is is a very much underutilized tool i think in behavior change because humans that's how we're wired right we we love stories we su- you suddenly engage in a story in a way that you don't engage in just hard facts and i i i spoke to as you know our mutual friend bj about this in la last year i was saying you know public health guidelines i think often fail badly because they're just facts you know that that it's just you know if you do this you'll reduce your chance of this and it's it, it's a bit boring there needs to be some story around it that connects with people's hearts filmmakers know this right filmmakers know this so so well and it's interesting that you have storytelling as a key part of helping people with their well-being how did that come about so you know what is interesting is that obviously i came from the world of media um having launched the Huffington Post i left the Huffington Post in 2016 to launch thrive because i wanted to help people move from awareness to action 
and uh, from simply knowing what they had to do to actually doing it. And um, but but I and a lot of the people who came with me to launch the new company came from the world of media. We were storytellers. Yeah, that's what we did, and uh, and we also knew how to activate people to tell their own stories. And uh, and that has been at the heart of our behavior change success at Thrive, uh, because we are finding that let's say if we go into a company wrong and let's say a big multinational company like Accenture and we work with their 500,000 employees and we get the CEO to tell her story of what she's doing and then we get the intern to tell his story and suddenly you have this whole... um, internal marketing campaign, if you want, yeah. about how to change habits. While the old HR system, if you think of it, is um, you put a benefit out there and you pay based on utilization. So yeah. there is no cultural change. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's I, I love what you said about the CEO sharing their story because I think that is so powerful when the guy or the woman at the top opens up shows that vulnerability that actually leads to vulnerability and more authenticity from the whole organization i imagine absolutely it's like cultural permission is granted yeah. uh, for people to speak about what they're going through to share solutions and they're small like we just completed a leadership series at walmart where people um start using our app, but also have webinars. And then they all share their stories. So you have all the stories that are populating the app so that you go to the app and it feels very personal because you have somebody you work with who is sharing, just to give you an example, how they stopped sleeping with their phone. And a micro step, they start their morning with one minute of deep breathing instead of rushing to their phone immediately, 60 seconds can be game changing, which is unbelievable if you think it's such an incredible source of optimism that in 60 seconds you can change the neural pathways of your brain and course correct from stress. Uh, I I don't know, I find this one of the biggest gifts from God. (laughs) Hey, I I agree. I mean, it just, I mean, I'm I'm so passionate about this stuff like you, I write about this stuff, but even hearing you say that, I can feel me getting excited because we we think it's gotta be tough. We think, oh, I've gotta do 30 minutes of breath work a day or, you know, go to the gym five times a week. We, we we really undervalue these small micro steps. And, you know, what I love about this, this idea of storytelling is I, I'm interested in how you get people, they share stories. I wonder if you ask them, you know, to write their own stories down perhaps, because what I found, Ariana, with patients when I've taken this approach is that they've tried things before. They've tried big lifestyle transformation in the past and often it's failed, and then they feel like a failure, right? So it becomes their story, I am a failure. But when they start making micro changes, whether, let's say it's a five minute workout. You know, I've spoken about this before, every, t- every morning when my coffee brews for five minutes, in those five minutes, I do a workout in my kitchen. I don't go to a gym, I don't have time for that, but I do that micro step every day. And you start, when I've done it with my patients, they start to change the story about themselves so they're no longer a failure. They start telling them a story that, hey, I'm, I can stick to a, a health regime. I'm the kind of person who works out every day or who does meditation every day. So I think the storytelling has, yes, storytelling to the world and our company, but also storytelling to ourselves. Absolutely. I love that. And there's something else that you wrote in your book that I love, which I'd love you to repeat, um, which I had never heard before, but I'm loving it. And I'm now quoting you everywhere. 
people may think, you know, five minutes, how can you change anything in five minutes? And you said, you know, if somebody told you to smoke cigarettes for five minutes, three times a day, or anyway, you should say it, it's your story because it really immediately brings it home. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad it resonated because, I mean, there's two, there's two strands to that. There's I remember, I can, I can remember, and you're someone who's, I think, written 15 books now. You know, I'm only on, on book four, but I remember writing this. And I was sitting there thinking, how can I make this? How can I really make the point that these small habits are going to add up? And I, I remember just, you know, going out for walks, trying to think, how can I make it simple so people get it? And then I thought, yeah, as you say, with bad habits, we understand if we were to smoke a cigarette five minutes continuously, day after day, we 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 understand we'd start to feel unwell, we'd cough, you know, we we may not sleep so well. Or if we were to have a soft drink, a full sugar soft drink for five minutes, you have to continuously slurp it, you know, until you until the five minutes is up. You know your mood is going to go down. Your teeth are going to hurt. Your, you know, we we feel that, but we don't see it in the same way with positive habits. And I think that's one of the big problems actually is how to sell the power of small positive steps. Well, here's the thing. I think we need to use what the fashion industry is using and the entertainment industry is using to sell things. Yeah. They know how to connect to people's hearts and not just their minds. And I think we need to do a better job. And that's what we did before we launched our behavior change up. We worked with a lot of people in the fashion industry, in the entertainment industry. A lot of that storytelling um, came from that. Because how can the fashion industry convince a woman, say, making 40000 dollars or pounds or euros, whatever, <laughs> a year to buy a $2,000 Prada bag. I mean, it yeah. makes no sense, right? So something is activated that makes her feel that this is aspirational. This is who she wants to be identified with. And there are so many examples like that. So why not take the same uh, tools to help people make the right, better choices for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and it's so obvious when you say it, you almost think back and go, well, why have we not widespread across society adopted this approach? Health is often very dry. It's very boring, right? Worthy. It's like very worthy. It's not fun. And you know what I loved about your book is the pictures you used. I love that you showed pictures where you, you know, they were so beautiful and, you know, the the flowers and the lemons and you walking through and, and, and there was spaciousness. And so it had an impact, an unconscious impact. Yeah. Uh, as I was reading your prescriptions in a way, but they were presented in an aspirational environment. It wasn't... It wasn't luxurious, like something nobody else could have. I'm super touched that you noticed that. And I've got to say, so my, my publisher in the UK are uh, Penguin Life. They're, they're the sort of publisher here. And I remember when, when my first book was coming out and we were talking about it and I shared them the proposal and I thought, this is so interesting. How, what are people going to think of me? What are my colleagues, what are my medical colleagues going to think if I have a, a book with photos in? You know, what's that going to do for my reputation? And then I was, I was, I was writing there and I thought, Rongan, why are you writing this book? Is it for your ego or are you actually writing it to help people? And I figured out, I, I did a bit of, you know, deep thinking for those few weeks. And I thought, actually, you're writing this book because you want to help people. You want to help as many people as possible. So, the goal should be then, you want to make this book as accessible as possible, particularly to the people who need this more than anyone else. And once I got really clear at the intention behind writing it, it was really easy to say, yeah, okay, let's make this 
a beautiful designed aspirational book a bit like you say the fashion industry right when they're trying to sell a product they make it seem as though oh, that's that's the life i want to lead i want to be that woman in that dress or that guy wearing that suit and that watch and exactly. it, it was very intentional i think all my books are published in that way certainly here in the uk and i actually think they really bring the lifestyle I'm trying to promote with people, it helps to bring it to life. Absolutely. And you want to have an impact. Exactly. That's what you are about. I mean, you said you want to affect 100 million people, yeah. right? To start living a healthier lifestyle. Well, how do you do that? You've got to use everything at our disposal. And also there is a sense of urgency. Um, so many people are destroying their lives because of unhealthy choices be and also because they think it's impossible to make healthy choices. It's so hard. It requires so much discipline and willpower. And I think what all the new science and what the work you are doing and I'm doing and BJ Fogg is doing is telling us that, no, you can't depend on willpower yeah. to change your habit. Yeah, no, for sure. Can I ask you, the storytelling piece really interests me. So let's say a company signs up with Thrive and you provide and your company provides help and well-being for them. How do they tell their story? I, I find that super fascinating. How do you help them do that? So basically, with all our, with all our big customers, um, what we bring to them in terms of the app and the webinars comes with an internal marketing campaign. Right. So they actually, um, we create videos and stories um, within the company. And then uh, often, in most cases, an external marketing campaign, because then they use it to be identified as the company that cares for its employees, yeah. which therefore leads to better recruitment, less attrition, and better business metrics generally. So you see, that for me is the complete cycle. Um, our app is like the coach in your pocket that's, that reminds you to do these things. It's divided into these four journeys that are the interconnected life. I think one of the problems with behavior change apps is they tend to be point solutions, like you have the meditation app or you have the steps app or you have the sleep app. And the truth is that everything is interconnected. Like if you don't sleep enough or well, it's going to affect what you eat. It's going to affect how much you move, et cetera. So our app is, is broken down into these four journeys. Recharge, which is about sleep and 60-second reset during the day. Fuel, which is about movement and what you eat. Connect, which is connecting with others, but starting with connecting with yourself. And focus, how do you get your brain to focus? Broken down into hundreds of micro steps, all of them with the storytelling people who've, who've um, practiced different micro steps, the impact it's had into their lives, and then inviting the user to tell their story. Yeah, incredible. 60 second resets. I think my audience would be super interested in what they are. So I wonder if you could expand. Thank you so much for asking me about that, Rongan, because it's my absolute favorite feature. And actually, we are launching it uh, with Zoom um, as what they are calling a Zap, an app within Zoom, so that in between uh, endless Zoom meetings, uh, instead of going through Zoom fatigue, you can play this reset. So let me tell you how it works. Um, reset is a feature in our app and will be uh, something you can launch on your Zoom app that comes preloaded with the guides, like a, a gratitude guide, a breathing guide, a stretching guide that basically helps you for 60 seconds um, course correct from stress. But the best feature about it is that it allows you to create your own personalized guide. 
uh, has pictures of my kids when they were young and unproblematic, um, uh, pictures of our dog, pictures of um, my favorite quotes, landscapes, and um, a piece of music, Yo Yo Ma playing Ave Maria, that really relaxes me. And all that with a breathing pacer. All that takes place in 60 seconds. Wow. So this is something, let's say you and I, before we started our conversation, could have played each other's guides. It would have taken us two minutes, but it would have brought us even closer together, although I think we're feeling very close. But (laughs) for people who are not as close in a business meeting, let's say you and I are in a business meeting, and then I play my guide or you play your guide, it suddenly brings some new intimacy and authenticity to the meeting. Yeah. So sharing those guides is another feature that we're excited about. Yeah, that that is really, really exciting, especially partnering with Zoom because the impact there could be huge because these are, they're such little things that have such a big impact. Um, what's really interesting is that I, and actually this is something I, I wanted to talk to you about is your culture within Thrive. I think, did you call it, compassionate directness and I loved it and and before you answer I just want to give you a bit of context for me so I went to medical school to become a doctor so I was trained to be an NHS national health service doctor and that's what I was doing but because of my sort of frustrations that we were serving only a small population of our patients well. And because I think 80% of what we see is related to our collective modern lifestyles, I wanted to see, well, how can I help people? How can I help my patients? And then I realized the power of the media to sort of, if you can try and get a message out there, you can impact a lot of people. Now, as part of that journey, I ended up starting this podcast a couple of years ago, which has grown so quickly to becoming the biggest health show in Europe. And I love doing it. But but why that's relevant to the question, Ariana, is I used to work for myself. I worked for the NHS. I'd go and do my job. Now I have a team of about seven or eight people to help get this show out each week. And I didn't learn how to run a team, right? I learned how to run myself. And when I saw, I read an article that you wrote on compassionate directness, and I loved it. I read it on Sunday. I've not stopped thinking about it since. And I'm looking forward to putting it into action with various members of the team and certainly hopefully within my little small team from all of us. So could you explain what it is and how you came up with it? So I came up with it by observing what makes cultures toxic. You know, I was on the board of Uber during Uber's crisis. And I saw that the most toxic thing in a culture is when people don't express what they're upset about, but they sit on it. And uh, these resentments become bigger and bigger. And so I wanted to create a culture both within Thrive and with the companies we work with that honors expressing what you're feeling. In a compassionate way, that's why we said compassionate directness, rather than adversarially, and not sitting on it. And when you do that, most of the time you you can clear the air, you can deal with it. Uh, Often people are not mind readers, we forget that, and we, we assume they know how we are feeling, but we don't. And uh, and we and also to make sure that it's not a hierarchical concept. Like an intern on your podcast should feel free to express something that's not working for her or him uh, to you, rather than uh, rather than uh, feeling that oh you know it's not my place to express it. Yeah. And it's not just about grievances; it's also about good ideas. Somebody may have an idea. They need to be empowered to express. But the corollary is the recognition that any successful company cannot be a debating society. At some point, you have to make a decision. (laughs) 
And then I love Jeff Bezos' um, principle of disagree and commit. Yeah. I love it. I'm actually reflecting on it quite a lot at the moment and thinking just it's it's very hard as you tell that story. It's hard for me not to try and, try and relay that to various episodes that have happened and things that continues to happen and how we're trying to improve things. I think compassionate directness is such a lovely term. But then, Ariana, it, it may, reminds me of something you said at the start of the conversation. So business relationships, getting teams to work well in business, actually the same themes are there outside business, right? So that kind of works. Compassionate directness, I reckon, is going to work with my wife, with my children, with my friends. So do you see much difference between... Work no, culture and all. home culture. Absolutely, not at all. In the most intimate, important relationships in our lives, always things come up that we're not happy about. I mean, even in the most loving marriage, I mean, I'm divorced, but you can speak to it. <laughs> and things come up, you know, whether it's um, tiny things like who took the garbage out or bigger things. Um, and I feel they're all solvable if they're expressed. Yeah. Yeah. And that, we know more and more that it's toxic to hold on to emotions. Actually, that's a huge stressor on the body. Not being able to express that, that is bad for your health. You know, there's so much research and data mounting up on that, right? Absolutely. And I think what you write about, you know, the importance of, um, of tackling the underlying stress, underneath all these chronic conditions because otherwise as you said uh, your patients were going to revert back to what they were doing if you yeah. don't tackle what the underlying stresses are yeah fantastic Irene, before you said that you started thrive to take people from awareness to action and i really love that as an idea but as I think about it more, what about people who are not even at that awareness stage? You know, and, and I'm, again, I'm sort of saying many of us, you know, we can see it clearly in other people. If we saw a, a Hollywood film about somebody who was working hard, they were sleep deprived, they were starting to be uh, annoying, they were starting to have arguments with people around them, we can see it easily in someone else's life. Yet we find it pretty hard to see in our own life. So how do you take people to awareness, which is, of course, the first step of any change? So, you know, awareness is, um, for me, twofold. The first is, let's take sleep. Sleep is a good example, because really, um, until relatively recently, we didn't even think sleep was important. So it was like we we saw, um, in fact, um, sleep deprivation as a badge of honor. Look at the language, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You snooze, you lose. Uh, businessmen especially bragging about how they pulled all-nighters, etc. So the first thing around awareness was simply giving people the data and the science but that was not enough. That's the point. That's what I discovered. People might have known that sleep was important, but then not being able to have um, to sleep well in their own life. So that's where the gap between awareness and action happened. And and as you are as you are implying, you know, people are on at different parts of the journey. There are still people who are still not convinced that sleep is important, but there are fewer and fewer. Yeah. And the same way around sugar, say. You know, um, there are still people who think it's not a problem to be eating lots of sugar every day, but fewer and fewer. So the, the hard thing now is moving people from knowing they should be getting enough sleep. They should be reducing sugar intake to actually being able to do it consistently. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, um, I agree. And I, I think one of the, I hesitate to say one of the upsides of the current global situation, but I think it's okay to recognize that any, 
anything negative also often has a flip side of positive. I don't think that's insensitive to, to sort of say that. And I actually think that people are getting squeezed so much that actually people are realizing now, wow, health and well-being is important. My stress is important. You know, my sleep is important. Are you as a company seeing more problems now that people are, you know, working from home? Do you see them actually, you know, because obviously boundaries is a massive issue now for people. How How is that sort of played out in, in, in terms of what you've seen? Yes, absolutely. We're seeing, first of all, many more mental health problems. And, uh, and what we're seeing is that now um, business executives, uh, CEOs, um, uh, CFOs, you know, are actually recognizing that because it's a business problem. So uh, the mental resilience of employees is no longer the province of human resources departments. Everybody in the business uh, cares about them. That's a huge shift. Um, these are no longer seen as nice to have benefits. They are seen as existential for the business. And, uh, and we are working with many companies, for example, to give them a better understanding of where their employees are. We've built um, a mental resilience dashboard, for example, um, that gives management uh, a view, anonymized and aggregated, so there are no privacy concerns, as to where their employees are in terms of their mental resilience, as well as their burnout risk. And that is so important for employers to know because it's kind of a, a leading indicator of where the business is going to be. Yeah. And there's so much new science. Um, there's a, a new piece of science coming out of Yale that shows that when employees are stressed, it's going to affect their productivity. It sounds obvious, but it hasn't been obvious for management. Yeah. They literally cannot get their brain to focus because their prefrontal cortex shuts down and they move into a fight or flight response. Now, that's a huge business problem. Yeah. And uh, that's what I think is the shift. And what you said about the upside of the pandemic, yes, it's as a Stanford economist said many years ago, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah. So now we have an opportunity to actually use this crisis to change what was not working pre-pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, Another article I saw that you wrote recently, you mentioned that it's important to declare an end to the day, even when you haven't completed everything. I think that is such powerful advice. And I wonder if you could sort of explain what exactly you mean by that and how that can help people. Yes, you know, it's, um, it's really amazing that um, Declaring an end to the day is one of my favorite micro steps right now, because the truth is that the vast majority of people do not have an end to their day. Yeah. You know, we could all stay um, answering emails, handling things through the night. So we need to declare it. And I believe in rituals. So I believe in um, a little ritual and my ritual is turning off my phone and charging it outside my room. In fact, uh, Thrive has launched only one product and we are selling it at cost because we are selling it to help people change habits rather than as a profit-making exercise. It's a little bed. It's a um, phone charging a little bed with a blankie and you can charge <laughs> it under the blankie, tuck them in, say good night. I'm going to send you one, Rongan, as a gift. Thank you. Because it's actually great for your kids. Your, your kids are nine and seven, right? Yeah, ten, 10 and seven now, yeah. And they probably don't have phones yet. They don't. And this is something that, well, A, you know, they know what daddy stands for and what he writes about in his books. But for me, there's a conflict between knowing what these what this technology can do, 
but not wanting my son or my daughter to be a social outcast in terms of what the rest of their friends are doing. And it's, it's something I'm wrestling with myself, if I'm honest. Well, I think, uh, Rangan, just being able to set boundaries, like when you have your phone bed, teaching, for example, your son, that's where your phone sleeps. From the beginning, it's not a punishment. It's like the way we teach our kids to brush their teeth. We teach them phone hygiene. Uh, Because one of the biggest problems is that teenagers sleep with their phones. I mean, we all sleep with our phones. (laughs) Um, unless we consciously choose not to sleep with their phones. That's the default position. So um, they sleep with their phones, and then in the middle of the night, they snap and they tick-tock, and and then they wake up exhausted, and that's the vicious cycle. So I think for me, uh, that's why we actually called it the family phone bed, because we wanted it to be used by families. It has room for 10 phones. Um, to to you know teach each other and support each other yeah. um, in building these good habits. I think that's one of the best things I've I've ever heard. A phone bed. I, I, I it's such a lovely concept, isn't it? And I like that that idea that it's not a punishment. You know, your phone, your beloved phone needs needs to rest. Here's a nice bed for it. I can't wait to see it. It's uh, <laughs> it's it sounds really really cool actually. You've obviously written a, an amazing book on sleep. And, you know, what are the habits that you do around your own sleep to make sure that you are getting as much as you need? Well, the science is very clear that um, unless you have a genetic mutation, and that's interesting, some people who are listening may have a genetic mutation. One to one and a half percent of the population does, and they don't need a lot of sleep. Um, you can take a genetic test or if you are conscious, <laughs> you probably know if you have it or not. I know I don't have it. If I get four hours, I'm like a zombie. I need eight hours. People need somewhere between seven and nine to be fully recharged, to go through all the cycles. Think of it like a dishwasher. Um, in my book on sleep, you can see that it's like you need to complete all the cycles. And the dishwasher is a good metaphor because you wouldn't say, hey, you know, I'm going to take it, take the laundry out 15 minutes earlier because I'm in a hurry. Well, you're going to end up with wet and dirty laundry because you have not completed the cycles. And sleep is as important for the body as it is for the brain. It's the only time when we can clear the toxins from the brain. And that's why now there are all these Uh, findings about the connection between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fascinating. It's so fascinating. I I absolutely agree that charging your phone outside the bedroom is, it's such a, it's it's like a keystone habit. If you get that right, the knock-on effect is quite significant. And I always say to people, look, don't beat yourself up. You know, these things are designed to be, addictive it's not it's not a failing on your part you know if you have it next to your bed and you wake up at three o'clock to use the bathroom and you then look at it on your way back that's not because you're weak it's it's you know it's designed for you to touch it and play with it and do things so I, I agree with you you know keeping it outside of the bedroom if I bring it into the bedroom which I do sometimes still I mostly don't but I'm human I'm tempted you know, I struggle, you know, I can't get off the thing. In fact, my wife and I have a, a deal with each other, which is like, we, we've got full permission to, you know, tell the other one, leave that phone in the kitchen, leave it, it charges in the kitchen overnight is basically how we try and do it. Great. And that's fantastic to have like an accountability body. So yeah. you are each other's accountability body. Um, and then no judgments. I mean, one of the things we... Uh, we tell our the people we work with is, you know, yes, we are not going to do a, to do it perfectly. No judgments. Let's just do it the next night. Yeah, no, for sure. Irina, I wanted to talk about your own mother because I've heard you talk about her on multiple occasions and what an amazing influence she was on you. 
Um, what would you say some of the key lessons that she taught you were? So one of the key lessons was uh, around failure. You know, she used to say that failure is not the opposite of success. It's a stop, stepping stone to success. And so she really taught my sister and me to be very willing to take risks and um, to be willing to fail along the way. And that made a big difference in, you know, starting businesses or even launching books. Because when you publish a book, you never know how it's going to be received. And a lot of people shy away from that. So I think that was a big, big lesson from her. Another one was um, her unconditional loving, which is, I think, the greatest gift we can give to our children uh, because it also empowered me to reach for whatever I wanted to achieve, knowing that if I didn't, she wouldn't love me any less. Yeah, wonderful. And are those two lessons that you think you have managed to also pass on to your own children? Um, I often ask them because I always um, have been judging myself against having an amazing mother. And and they tell me I do. And I, you know, my, my kids went through a lot of problems. You know, my youngest daughter dealt with anorexia. My oldest daughter dealt with drugs. She's been sober for eight years now. So it's not like it was a story of linear success. Uh, but we we kind of, through all, everything we went together, I feel that um, they've become so much more um, resilient and loving towards others. And actually my, my youngest daughter, who is a painter, she um, did art at Yale and she's made her living by painting, um, now has her first book coming out. I'll send it to you. Uh, it was kind of interesting. She she was hit by a bike in New York two and a half years ago and hit her head hard on the pavement and suffered from debilitating headaches and a lot of other medical problems as a result. And during that time, she she had her own like a spiritual awakening. And so she wrote this book, which is an audible original coming out in November, which was going to be called My Cosmic Quarrel with the Universe and Other Minor Matters, but now it's called The Map to the Unknown. But it was kind of interesting for her generation in her 20s, grappling with these big existential questions of God and the universe and meaning, plus chronic pain. And, and um, it was wonderful. And being very funny, I think sometimes using humor uh, even um, during difficult moments in our lives is one of the best ways to get our messages across. Yeah, no, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I look forward to reading your daughter's book. It sounds sounds incredible. Um, you mentioned she had a spiritual awakening. And I've often got the thought in my head as I've I spent a lot of time reading about you over the last few days, actually. And as I said, it's really been very enjoyable. There's so much out there. But often I've heard things like you mentioned Stoic philosophy, or you mentioned the Indian text, the Bhagavad Gita. And I've often thought, you know, are you spiritual? How do you feel that these ancient texts and these ancient philosophies how and can they help us in the modern 21st century? Oh, a thousand percent. In fact, um, the last piece I wrote in my newsletter, I'll send it to you, is about this, uh, all, all of our spiritual quests. And I wrote a book in the 90s about it, which don't worry about four people read. So don't worry if you didn't read it. Uh, which was called The Fourth Instinct. And uh, 
for me, the if you think of the first three instincts, um, being survival, sex, and power, you know, different biologists and psychologists give them different names, but these are the three acknowledged instincts. I think you can't understand human behavior without looking at what I call the fourth instinct, which is our instinct towards um, meaning and something larger than ourselves, which if you want is the spiritual instinct. And a lot of people have rejected it because they've rejected uh, organized religion, but the instinct is an instinct. And organized religion is just one of thousands of manifestations and ancient wisdom, whether it's in the Bhagavad Gita, or the Tao in China, or Zen in Japan, or the Stoics, um, is just really many different ways to describe one universal truth, which is that we all have in us that place of wisdom, peace, and strength. And most of the time we are completely disconnected from it. And the, all these pauses that we are <clears throat> encouraging people to bring into their lives are about giving us opportunities to reconnect to that place, which is our birthright. We all have it. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I'm in my early 40s. I find that, you know, my mother was very religious. She would pray every day. Um, I was surrounded by that at home. She's a Hindu, like a lot of Indian families are. But I would consider myself a bit more spiritual than religious. I feel there has got to be something greater than just me. There's got to be, not there's got to be, there is. I, I, I very much value solitude. Actually, when you're talking about micro habits, I actually think one of the most important micro habits for anybody anywhere in the world today is solitude. And I think these phones are one of the reasons why, because for all their benefits, you know, if you look at that thing first thing in the morning and you're looking at it until you go to bed, you don't have any time to yourself. Everything is external. Everything is reactive. And so I am always talking about solitude to my patients and, and to the public. Say, you know, how even 10 minutes, even five minutes of solitude a day where you're not on that device and you're not consuming something else you know, just allow your thoughts to come up. I mean, it's something I crave more and more. And actually, I guard it very, very rigidly in my life. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on solitude. And do you take steps to make sure you get some each day? Yes, absolutely. And um, I, you're absolutely right, first of all, about the phone being like the greatest enemy of solitude and uh, reconnecting with ourselves. Because basically um, those moments of solitude are competing with all the stimulation <laughs> from our phone and, and it's a hard competition. So we need, first of all, to understand the value of solitude and that's why I think breaking it down into this one minute or five minute increments makes a big difference because you are not asking for a big commitment. And um, for me, it's um, I start my day like that. I start my day with meditation, and um, and then at night I I always love to read something which has nothing to do with my work. Um, a spiritual text. Listen, you come from such amazing culture. I, I spent time in India when I was 18 uh, studying comparative religion at Shantaniketan University outside Calcutta. And I love, I love the country, the culture, the food, everything. Um, but the wisdom. And when we um, do our work in India or in China, we try to connect everything we are saying with their ancient wisdom. Because even if people are disconnected from it, something in their DNA resonates. So um, we've, we've done you know, um, a whole series on Chinese ancient wisdom, for example, and the Tao, a video series that we incorporate in our app. And 
and also invite people to tell their stories. A lot of modern people are actually still practicing different parts of their ancient traditions, but they don't speak about it as much. Yeah. You know, it's funny as, and I'm sure you may, or maybe with your kids, uh, maybe be, be familiar with this, but, you know, my parents came over from India to the UK. And so like many immigrant families, you have this, particularly in your teenage years, you have this real clash with trying to fit in with the culture around you versus the culture you have at home. And it's funny, this rich Indian, you know, culture that that, it, that has been there, I think I suppressed for years. I think I wouldn't allow it to come out and flourish in me because I, you know, I wanted to be Western. I wanted to do what my friends were doing. But it's funny, as I sort of tap into myself, as I get a little bit older, I'm really reconnecting with it. I'm reading the Gita at the moment. Actually, that's the book I read at the moment in the morning. And it's it's funny, you, you can you can often think that, you know, what did these guys know? We're in a different world now. We've got technology, we're busy. But you know what? It's amazing how many of those truths ring true just as much today. Oh, absolutely. And indeed, science is validating ancient wisdom. Yeah. And and the Gita really described these three lives. I think it's like such a prophetic description. I don't know if you got to that passage, you know, which is, you know, the the life of inertia, you know, what we would call today the couch potato. And, you know, there are still some people like that, but that's not the big problem. The second life is the life of business, extreme frenetic business, which is our modern life. And the third life is the life that we are aspiring to now that we want to to create. So it was just like beautifully expressed in the poetry of the Gita, but also completely validated by the latest neuroscience. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's never been easier, has it, to to get away from ourselves. And, and again, I don't want to admit, blame I don't want to blame phones for everything. I think there's so many incredible things that phones do. Of course, I want to make that clear. But at the same time, we never have to be uncomfortable anymore. We, you know, any moment of discomfort or having to sit with our own thoughts, we can numb that straight away. It doesn't have to be alcohol or cigarettes or any more or sugar. It can be those things, but we, we can just pull out of our pocket our smartphone and distract ourselves for hours, can't we? Absolutely. And it's, and it's something that we need to be very conscious about, um, about, dealing with and setting boundaries in the social dilemma it 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 shows how this is deliberate this is not just accidental that um that these phones come programmed with all the hooks all the um neuroscientific hooks that that make us addicted yeah i actually think it goes beyond our own health I actually have been reflecting a lot recently about this idea that a human being cannot compete with one of these phones. I just don't feel, you know, even your partner, right? This phone has been curated with your history, the things that you look at with the algorithms. It just keeps pushing to you everything that you've positively consumed with a dopamine hit how can your wife compete? How can your kids compete? It's it's actually an unfair battle. And I would go as far as to say, I think phones or the unintentional use of our smartphones is not just impacting our health, it's damaging our most important relationships. I completely agree with you, completely agree. And it's, I mean, the way you are describing it is like describing the most amazing mistress. Yeah. You know, gorgeous, sexually trained, um, uh, incredibly intellectual. You know, you could bring everything together that and knowing what are your buttons. It's not just like a, a generalized uh, ideal mistress, but each person's um, ideal one. Yeah, that's a beautiful description. You should write a piece about that. 
Yeah, no, I'd love to. I've, I'm writing a few things down at the moment. It's just an idea that I, I can't throw from my brain. I just think it's it's. Uh, I think it's super important. And and one of my favorite things that is each night. And I don't know if you've got to this bit in my book yet, but it's the tea ritual that I do with my wife every night. And it's just five minutes. It's a commitment that we are sit once the kids are in bed with a pot of mint tea. And we were literally without devices that the, the the commitment is just five minutes to catch up with each other. If it happens to be half an hour and 40 minutes, that's great. But if it's only five minutes, then that's enough. And you know that that micro habit, when we do it, it results in a more intimate relationship, a closer, a more loving relationship. And when we don't do it, little niggles start to build up. And, you know, we're so, both of us are so passionate about these micro habits, but I really just want to hammer home to people. They really make a difference. Just even if you just choose one and stick to it. Absolutely. I love it. Look at, look at, look at your book. Underline with stickies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very and, touched. And I absolutely love also the tea ritual. I mean, tea is another ritual. And um, and I practice it a lot, you know. Um, I mean, this is actually one of the things that the Indians and the and the English have in common, right? I mean, the the cup of tea that's supposed to solve all problems, there is something about it. Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. And and again, it goes back to what you say, the ritual, the ritualistic aspects. Of course, we could do that without a tea. We could just sit there. But there's something about the tea, the making of it, the pouring it out, right? And that's why, you know, the Japanese have this 30 minutes to make a cup of tea, right? But that that is that just shows how important it it can be. And, and I think it it lends, it brings a lot of intimacy and closeness. And actually, that's one thing I do want to talk to you about is that you have consistently been ahead of the curve in your career, whether it's your first book when you're writing about women should be given equal respects, whether they, you know, if they, if, whether they choose to be mothers, whether they choose to work, whatever it is, you know, in the early 1970s, that's way ahead of its sort of time when it came to, to prime time. You also did the same, I think, with Thrive Global in terms of, you know, it's now needed more than ever. It was very prophetic, I think, in terms of what's required. But when I heard you talk about the Huffington Post, there's something you said that really struck a deep chord with me. And you, uh, and again, if I've if I've got this slightly incorrect, please correct me. But it was about this idea that just before you started it, you saw bloggers and you thought, well, these are more conversational. There's real authenticity in these blogs. And you sort of took advantage of that with your amazing platform, the HuffPost. And I also see a very similar pattern with podcasting today in that why are podcasts exploding? Why are they the fastest growing uh, outlets in media? And I think it's because we are craving authenticity and we're sick of sound bites in the mainstream media, a, a one minute cut conversation right down. And I have purposely gone to these longer form conversations. And again, I say conversations, they're not interviews, they're conversations, and they're just getting more and more popular. So I just thought it was quite an interesting comparison, what you saw in the was it the early 2000s, I think, for the... We launched, we launched uh, Half Post in 2005. Yeah, so do you see, like, in terms of, I wonder if you could just, have I got that right in terms of your uh, perception of the media landscape back then? And then do you see a similarity in terms of podcasting and why that's exploding? <clears throat> Absolutely. And I love what you said. The key is conversation. <clears throat> it's not like a, an interview. And I mean, that's what I love about your podcast, that it's really conversational. And um, you speak about your life, your guest speaks about their life. And that's, that's what resonates with people. And I think that's why you see this explosion yeah. in podcasts. And, and inside the conversation, there are a lot of things that people can take away for their own lives. And we are both passionate about that. We are passionate about having an impact. And I love that you 
um, you said, you know, you want to impact 100 million people because I'm equally ambitious. And that's why I was so excited when we launched this partnership with Walmart to be the exclusive wellness provider for the 2.2 million employees. I thought, great, that's a large number. And, uh, and also to be able to support not just people who have the luxury to work from home now, but for people who are in stores, yeah. in factories, and to see the impact there. Take a look at our, we launched an Instagram account, Thrive Zip, uh, ZP. And really it's going to touch your heart to read these stories and to see the changes people are making in their lives through these small, tiny, better choices. Yeah, just amazing work you continue to do, Ariana. And what, when I hear that 2.2 million, I think that's not just 2.2 million people because there's a ripple effect from that. That's their partner, their children, their parents, their friends, right? That's how this stuff spreads. If they do an act of gratitude as a micro step and they share that with their family and then their family share it with one of their friends, well, it's not 2.2 million people anymore. It's probably 50 million, right? Absolutely. That's such a good point. And their community. And uh, we are actually now working with whole communities, like in Muskegon, Michigan, was the first community to work with. And try and bring everything that can possibly uh, lead to these small, better habits. I mean, we've gamified a lot of it. We've launched 21-day challenges with financial rewards. We give 15, um, we have 15 winners every month. And they go, they, the rewards range from $1,000 to $25,000. So basically, why not use every possible incentive? If you think of it, companies and the whole industries use terrible incentives to hook people yeah. into bad behaviors. We should not be above using the same incentives to hook people into good behaviors. Yeah. Well, ultimately, it's human behavior, isn't it? We're, we're motivated a certain way. There's a certain way to get humans to do what you want them to do. And as you say, these so-called bad behaviors, they've mastered how to do it. So let's use the same techniques. Um, Aaron, as we come towards the end, I, I always like to leave people with practical type tips. You know, I want hopefully some inspiration from the conversation but I also want them to take away some practical things that they can start doing in their own life. Now, before we get to that, I, again, want to acknowledge you for the amazing work you, you continue to do. You quoted, I think it was in your interview with Oprah, maybe, which I heard at the weekends, because um, I love quotes and I have a few kicking around the house. I love a lot of the... Um, yeah, I, I just love them because they really help you look at things in a slightly different way. And I've never heard that roomy one that you shared with Oprah, I think, live life as if it is rigged in your favor. That made me stop, press pause, and just think about if you start applying that to everything in life, even when things aren't going well, and you just go, oh, no, that's rigged for me. It's really, really powerful. I wonder if you could share why that's so powerful for you and if there's any other quotes that you want to share with my audience. Yeah, so Ronald, this is my favorite quote precisely because when I look back on my life, there were so many things that uh, didn't happen the way I wanted them. Some of them were heartbreaks. And when I look back, I think, oh my God, that that was the best thing that could possibly have happened. I mean, I, I was in love with this man, for example, in England, who was an un unbelievable writer. You can check him out, Bernard Levin. And we were together for seven years, but he didn't want to have children. Um, he only wanted to have cats. And I was clear I wanted to have children. So I ended up literally leaving England to basically... Um, leave this man because I didn't trust myself that I would um, be able to stay in London and not go back to him. So everything that happened in my life, really, my whole life in the States, my books, my children, the Huffington Post, Thrive Global, I happened because a man wouldn't marry me. Good to remember that when things go wrong. And for me, that's really what Rumi 
means in terms of live life as though everything is rigged in your favor because you never know until you look back. Yeah, that's wonderful, wonderful advice for all of us. Ariana, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. So in all your years of experience, both personally and professionally, can you leave my listeners, my viewers, with some really practical tips that they can think about applying into their own life immediately to improve the quality of their lives? Absolutely. And um, it's back to micro steps. So I would really um, want to leave you with three of my favorite micro steps. We already mentioned one, which is a peak at time at the end of your day that you declare the end of your day. Uh, mark it by turning off your phone and charging it outside your room. And that also means this is the moment you stop consuming coronavirus news, which is essential if you're going to have a recharging night's sleep. The second favorite micro step is how you start your day. 60 seconds before you go to your phone. And those 60 seconds are key because that's the time to focus on your breath, remember what you're grateful for, set your intention for the day, something where you have agency (laughs) over the rest of your day instead of being at the mercy of what's incoming. If you think of it, that's how most of us start the day. Like, what does the world want of me instead of what do I want? from my day and from the world. And um, the third thing, something that you write about um, in your book as well, is the recognition that breath is our superpower. And uh, we have to remember that throughout the day, at different moments, you know, stress is unavoidable, cumulative stress is not. And if we can arrest, Um, the cycle of stress, we truly transform our health and our productivity. And, you know, I, you're a doctor. So when you say that um, how important it is to recognize that our behaviors trump our genetics, That is key, and stress is at the heart of that. And breath is, again, our superpower. You talk about a three, four, five breath. Uh, Another favorite breathing technique I want to leave your listeners with that the Navy SEALs practice here in the States is box breathing, which is inhale to the uh, count of four, pause to the count of four, exhale to the count of four, whatever, experiment. That's what's wonderful about that. Experiment, but find something that you can return to multiple times during the day when you're stressed. Um, there are times when you're so stressed, you may not even <laughs> um Remember that you can breathe more consciously where during those times you can just play your um, pre-arranged reset guide with all the things you love about your life as a reminder of what you are grateful for because Rongan, as you know, gratitude is the greatest antidote to stress and anxiety. Yeah, that's such wonderful advice. Of course, Everything that you've spoken about today, we will link to. I, I'd, I'd love people to do that reset. I'd, I, I'm looking forward to creating my own, actually. That sounds wonderful. Ariana, you know, really, it, it's been such an honor to talk to you today. You have been incredible. You've been open. You've been authentic. You've shared so much wisdom. Uh, you've offered to send me so many things. I'm definitely going to send you a copy of my second book, The Stress Solution. I really think you'll like it. It's from a couple of years back. But I've got this concept of micro stress doses and macro stress doses that I, I'm pretty sure you're going to resonate with. So I'll, I'll put one in the post tomorrow for you. Right. Uh, uh, I hope you enjoy that. But honestly, my honor to speak to you today. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get the chance to do this again, but face to face when the world starts to return back to normal.
Thank you so much, Ranga, and thank you for all you are doing. And let's keep finding ways to work together. For sure. Thank you. Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you've lived more.